Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. You know, I've been investing for over 30 years. I've been writing about investing for the past, oh, 15 years or so. And one of the questions I get quite a lot is, in a portfolio, should you invest in an S&P 500 index fund or a total stock market index fund? And it's a good question, and it's one that sort of torments folks. I don't think it needs to. Actually, I think the answer is really, really simple. Uh, but the explanation takes a little time. We're going to walk through that today. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare two Vanguard ETFs. We're going to first compare uh, the, the S&P 500 index ETF, which is ticker VOO, like VU, uh, and then uh, the Vanguard ETF that covers the total U.S. stock market, and that's uh, ticker VTI. They're good representations of the two uh, markets that they cover. And it's interesting because what we're going to learn is there are a lot of significant differences between the two uh, funds, the two types of investment strategies, S&P 500 versus total stock market. And yet when it counts, what really matters most, there's hardly any difference at all. Now, I know that that sounds like that can't be. Well, give me a minute and I'll explain why. The first thing I want to do is sort of just walk through uh, the differences and similarities between uh, the S&P 500 uh, ETF, VU, and the total stock market uh, ETF, VTI. So let's go to the monitor. What you're looking at, and uh, apologize for all these ads, you can thank Morningstar for that, but there's some good information in here that I'm gonna unpack for you. We're looking at uh, VU right here. This is the uh, Vanguard S&P 500 uh, index ETF. I'm gonna go to the quote page. And over here, go back to the quote page as well, this is VTI, total stock market. And uh, we can see they're both very inexpensive. This one's just three basis points. You see that there under expense ratio. And the total stock market ETF, that same three basis points. So very uh, inexpensive. Uh, what we wanna dive into first though are the portfolios of each of them. So we're gonna go to the portfolio tab in Morningstar. And we can see just from the style box, and if this is new to you, I've done an entire series on uh, how to use Morningstar, which you can check out on the channel. Uh, but this just gives you a very quick snapshot of each fund. What this tells us is they're both large cap funds. That would be the top row, since the, the blue dot is, uh, in this case, for the S&P 500, it's almost like above the top row. So it's like really large cap. And it's a blend. It's, it's not tilted towards value or growth, but it's in the middle. And you would expect that because it's an index of effectively the uh, most of the largest 500 companies headquartered in the U.S. And the total stock market, uh, it, the blue dot if, is a little lower, but still very large cap uh, weighted. And again, it's in, in the middle, so it's a blend fund as well. If we go to the actual holdings, this is where things kind of get interesting. Right here, you see the top 10 holdings. Again, this is for uh, the S&P 500 index ETF, VU. And here are the top 10 holdings for the total, st uh, total uh, stock market, VTI. Now, if you go through the list, you'll see the top 10 holdings are identical. Starts at Apple is number one, number 10, Johnson and Johnson, but the portfolio weight is different. You can see here for the total stock market index, Apple comprises about four and a half percent of the fund, whereas for the S&P 500 index uh, ETF, it's about five and three quarters. So this is a, a really important thing to understand. Most index funds, this is not specific to Vanguard, this would be true if we looked at the same types of funds at Schwab or Fidelity or anywhere, they're market cap weighted. What that means is uh, the more valuable a company, the more it represents in the particular index. Since Apple is the most valuable company in the world at the moment, uh, it receives most of your money or more of your money than any other company in either index. So for example, with uh, the S&P 500 over here, if you were to invest $500, uh, excuse me, $100 in VU, uh, $5.74 would go to Apple. And if you were to invest $100 in VTI, that's the total stock market ETF, then $4.53 uh, would go uh, to Apple. That, if you're new to index, index investing, index funds, that may come as a surprise. It's like, well, why do they do that? Why not just 
spread our money equally over uh, 500 companies in the uh, S&P 500 index or for the total stock market, you can see it's total number of holdings right here, about 3,700. Why not just spread it out evenly? And there, there are actually some funds that will do that, but they're, they're the exception. And the idea is simply this, these funds are designed to mirror the market. And the market doesn't spread capital evenly across, say, the 500 companies in the S&P 500 index, uh, right? Apple has more of it. Apple has a much greater valuation than uh, the smallest company uh, in the S&P 500. And the same would be true for a total stock market index. And so this is a, an important thing to understand. If we look at and we add up the top 10 companies that you see here for each fund, we'll find that for, for VU, that's the one on the left, the S&P 500 index ETF, the top 10 companies comprise just over 26% of uh, the total fund. So for every $100 you invest in an S&P 500 index fund, about $26 go to the top 10 companies. Now, in the case of uh, the fund on the right here, VTI, the Total Stock Market Index ETF, since there are a lot more companies, it's spread out over more companies, but it's still significantly weighted to the top 10. If you add up the, the, the percentage of portfolio weights that you see in this column right here, it doesn't come up to 26% like it does with uh, the S&P 500, but it's still about 21.5%. So very significant weighting towards the large companies. So that's sort of a couple of differences. S&P 500 has about 500 companies in it. Uh, the total stock market uh, index ETF has about 3,700 companies. Uh, that being said, there's a lot more similarity to them, heavily weighted towards the top 10 companies. The weighting's a little different, but still significant for both of them. Now, the next thing we wanna to touch on are the dividends and what's the dividend yield? So we're gonna go back to the quote page and we can see the, the dividend yield over the last 12 months, the 12 month yield. And for the S&P 500, you can see it's 1.48 and see that right here. And for the VTI, total stock market ETF, it's a little lower, 1.37. And that kind of makes sense. The larger companies that have been generally have been around a long time, they're uh, you know, they've, they're, they're leaders in their industry and um, they tend to pay uh, higher dividends as opposed to the smaller companies that are just getting started. Uh, uh, then, you know, they don't often pay a dividend. Now, that's a sort of a, a gross generalization. There are obviously large companies that don't pay a dividend. In fact, if we shoot back over to the portfolio for a moment and we look at the top 10 holdings, you know, um, uh, Facebook doesn't pay a dividend. Amazon doesn't pay a dividend. Alphabet, which is Google doesn't pay a dividend. Tesla doesn't pay a dividend. So there are certainly exceptions, but when you sort of add it all up and look at all of the companies in each index, you're generally gonna have a slightly higher uh, dividend yield for, for an S&P 500 index fund uh, than you will a total stock market index fund. I personally don't view that as a difference that matters, but some people are very focused on the dividend. And so you need to know there is um, a slight difference. Now, what really matters, I think, is performance, right? Which one performs better? So to, to figure that out, we're gonna pop over to Portfolio Visualizer. This is a tool I've shown you in the past. It's a free tool, you can use it yourself. Uh, it's, it's a great way to look at the performance over time of, port, of different portfolios. So I've set this up. We're gonna look from 1972, which is as far back as it goes, to the, to the present. We're gonna assume we invest $10,000 at the start. A lot of money today. That was really a lot of money in 1972, the year my parents bought the home I grew up in. I think they paid $29,000 for it. Anyway, we're gonna um, add to, to the um, investment $500 a month. Actually, you know what we're gonna do? I'm gonna actually zero this out. We're not gonna contribute at first. I wanna show you the difference. So we'll just, just start, assume a lump sum investment. $10,000. Portfolio one is the U.S. stock market, so that would be like a VTI. And portfolio two is U.S. large caps, so that would be like an S&P 500 index. And how have these two portfolios done? Well, you can see, you can hardly, it almost looks like there's a mistake. They've only looked at one portfolio, but no, there's actually two lines there. They're just so close 
you can't hardly tell the difference. If we look at the $10,000, it did grow a bit more in portfolio one. And remember, that's US market, total stock market. Our portfolio went to about 1.5 million uh, versus about 1.44 million. So there was, it, 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 there was a slight difference. Now that's over a 50 year period. Uh, but there is a, a, a difference, and you can see it, it's also reflected in the compound annual growth rate. At the same time, standard deviation is a measure of risk, how volatile the investment is. Portfolio one, the total stock market, is slightly more volatile. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because it includes small and mid-sized companies, which tend to be a little more volatile uh, than large companies. But again, not a huge difference. Now, when you're looking at long-term returns, I think it's important to actually not do what I just did. That is, start with a lump sum and never assume any additions to it. Why? Because most of us don't invest that way. Most of us don't start off you know, as an investor and just put a lump sum in and then never add to it again, right? We're contributing monthly in a 401k or maybe every year in an IRA or whatever. So I like to model that. So we're gonna contribute a fixed amount uh, and see if there's any difference. So we're gonna do $500, we'll adjust it for inflation and we'll do it monthly, right? And if we analyze this portfolio, the first thing you're gonna notice is the numbers get ginormous. And that may seem impossible. It's like, well, wait a minute, 10,000, 500 a month, sure you adjust, adjust that for inflation, but 22 million, come on, Rob, this, this tool has got to be broken. Well, 50 years is a very long time. Uh, and in fact, let's just experiment with this for a minute. Let's just lop off five years. So instead of starting in 72, and start, instead of starting at the age of 22, you decide to wait until you're 27, right? We're gonna just lop off five years. How big a difference can that make? Well, our 22 million, after we analyze this portfolio, drops to 12. Now I'll grant you, $12 million is still a lot of money, but by delaying five years, you just lost $10 million. Yeah, it's one of the reasons Warren Buffett's so wealthy. Yeah, he's a good investor, but he also has lived a long time. All right. Let's go back to our original assumptions. You can see when we add in a monthly investment, there's almost no difference at all. From 10,000 to over 22 million, the difference is only 300 grand. The compound annual growth rate, three basis points. Uh, again, the, the uh, total stock market won out, but by a very, very small amount. And you always wanna look at risk and volatility. We go back to standard deviation. And you can see it's 15.62% versus 15.27%. Even if statistics are not your friend and your eyes glaze over when you think about standard deviation, the takeaway is that there's virtually no difference in the volatility of, of these uh, two types of in investments. I will say briefly before we get to like how we actually gonna make a decision which one we should invest in that uh, you do see that in periods of growth, like we've had over the last 10 years, that an S&P 500 index tends to outperform. And then when you get into trouble, uh, then maybe the total stock market tends to do a little bit better. Uh, but at the end of the day, long-term investing through many economic cycles, there's virtually no difference uh, between the two. All right, so having said that, how are we going to decide which one to invest in? So I kind of have three, I guess, decision met metrics, if you will, or th that I think of. The first is inside of 401k, you may not have a choice. The 401k I currently have offers an S&P 500 index fund, doesn't offer a total stock market index fund. And I've seen that quite frequently, actually. Now, you may have access to both. We'll cover that in a minute. But if you don't, the, the key is either one is great. And uh, so it doesn't really matter if you've only got access to one, don't view that as a, you know, a problem or a thing, a thing to worry about. Just invest in the one that you've got uh, for your US stocks. Again, I have an S&P 500 uh, index available to me in my 401k, and I'm perfectly fine, fine with that. Now, if you do have a choice or you're investing in an IRA or a taxable account where you absolutely do have a choice, then I take two approaches. The first is if I wanna have all of my U.S. stock exposure in a single fund. And that might be, for example, if you invest in a three-fund portfolio, which I've talked about uh, in the past and can link to it uh, below, 
uh, the video, then I tend to go with a total stock market index fund. It's not because I think it'll outperform. We just saw the performance numbers. They're pretty much identical, but I figure why not take the added diversity, even if it's not significant, it's still more diversified if the volatility or risk is effectively the same and the performance is effectively the same. Why not get greater coverage? And in fact, when you look at a three fund portfolio, uh, whether it's using Vanguard funds or Fidelity funds or, or Schwab or whatever, I think most use a total stock market index fund like Vanguard's VTI. On the other hand, if I want to sort of slice and dice my portfolio a little bit more, which is what I tend to do, um, and I have what I tend to use is a six fund portfolio. Again, I'll leave a link to, to what that looks like uh, below this video. Uh, I'm going to add U.S. small cap stocks, maybe U.S. small cap value. And in that case, I tend to go with an S&P 500 index fund. Why? It gives me more control over the specific allocation, uh, asset allocation that I'm, I'm trying to achieve uh, inside the portfolio as a whole. So those are sort of my sort of the, my decision tree, if you will, how I work through this. If I'm in a 401k and I've only got one option, I don't worry about it. Both S&P 500 index and total stock market index funds are great. Uh, if I do have a choice, whether inside a 401k or anywhere else, uh, and I want to keep things simple, I'm going to do something like a three fund portfolio. I go with the total stock market index fund. On the other hand, uh, if I want to allocate some to small cap um, and I want to sort of slice and dice my portfolio, perhaps with a six fund portfolio, then I tend to go with an S&P 500 index along with usually a small cap or small cap value fund. And that way I have more control over the actual asset allocation. So there you go. There are some of the key differences between an S&P 500 index fund and a total stock market index fund. We specifically looked at VOO versus VTI. The good news is while there are definitely differences between the two types of investments, at the end of the day, both are excellent options for U.S. equity exposure. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll do my best to help you out any way I can. Until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.